Structure from Motion is a 3D modeling technique that uses digital photographs to construct the models. And what it's actually doing is pulling points that kind of repeat in different pictures. At the end of the day, what you actually do have is a, a 3D model, um, sort of movable, turnable, three-dimensional digital representation of that artifact. I mean, it's, it's really the next best thing to having it in your hand. In the late fall of 1936, the eventual leader of UNC's Research Labs of Archaeology was lecturing members of the Natural History Club in Raleigh. There seemed to be a lack of interest in the state's culture prior to the arrival of Europeans. To a student of human culture, he argued, one period of history should be just as important as another. The young Joffrey Lanning Co., then only 20 years old, already knew as much about the evolving field of scientific archaeology as anybody in the state, but he still had plenty to learn. Much of it he would learn over the next 50 years on a bluff above the Little River near Mount Gilead, North Carolina. There, a farmer named Lloyd Frucci was having trouble with artifact collectors. The mound stuck up out of the earth, sort of like a, a sore thumb, especially for a farmer named Lloyd Frucci, who owned the land. Every year, he would come out to plow his field in preparation to plant, and doing so, pulled up new artifacts, beckoning people to come in. They would walk around looking for what they could find and trample his rows. He decided the solution was to essentially bulldoze the mound. If he could tear the mound down, the landmark would be gone and people wouldn't know exactly where to look. Fortunately, Dr. Coe got wind of this plan and was able to talk him out of demolishing it until archeology span could investigate it to see if it was something that was worth saving. Coe mentioned that when he was first taken to Town Creek, his grandfather drove him down and he said, the loneliest day of my life was when I saw the plume of dust trailing behind my grandfather's vehicle as he drove up the road going back home and I was left alone with the cotton field behind me and the dust in front of me. What began as a camping adventure would grow into a research project spanning nearly five decades. Coe's drive to discover more about Native American cultures took him to other sites in the immediate area and across the state, where he developed an approach to archaeology marked by meticulous excavation techniques and sound analysis. In 1964, he published his signature work, a book widely regarded as the cornerstone of archaeology in the southeastern United States. Coe's research enabled him to distinguish between different periods of native occupation, separated in some cases by thousands of years. Near the end of his life, Coe said it was careful methodology that allowed archaeologists to see prehistoric cultures as more than just a jumbled pile of arrowheads. Prior to that understanding, he said, it was just Indians and us. Putting it all together, we gradually have lifted ourselves out of the unknown mud, and uh, we don't know. Sometimes we don't think we know very much, but we sure know a lot more than we did back in 1936. If scientific archaeology gave rise to a nuanced understanding of native cultures based on data and interpretation, it didn't replace the earlier collector-based approach to native artifacts overnight. Even as Coe worked at Town Creek, a doctor just down the road in the hamlet of Ellerby was busy becoming one of the most prodigious collectors of his generation. 
his collection was so hum humongous, he just needed a place to, to keep things. And we had a lot of discussion, uh, and he had a lot of discussion about wanting to share what he had collected. Uh, wherever he may have traveled to, he usually brought something back of some significance. And that's the way the museum got started. Joffrey Coe and Presley Rankin were contemporaries, uh, close in the same age. They both were native North Carolinians, uh, Coe being born in Greensboro, uh, Rankin being born in Mount Gilead. They were sons of privilege in some ways, but they both had an insatiable curiosity about the past. Coe, on one hand, pursued an academic challenge. Rankin pursued another path. His love of archaeology and geology and wildlife led him to collect things all of his life, oftentimes buying land, uh, clearing trees, collecting the artifacts that were exposed on the surface, or sometimes even buying artifacts that were put up for auction or sale. He had a keen interest in Native Americans and Native American history. Once he realized that, that that was also an interest that I had and, and also that I was a um, full-blooded Native American, uh, he and I just developed a relationship that lasted up until his death. He had some special places uh, in this county and a couple of other counties where uh, other people didn't know that there were artifacts there and, and he always wanted to keep that uh, to himself and we all, we just took a pack many, many years ago. Uh, that we just would not talk about a lot of those things. And, and I still don't talk a lot about it. I'm still very loyal to, to Doc. He was loyal to me and I'm, I'm, I've always been loyal to him. It's a very difficult subject to address when you talk about collecting versus academic archeology. span Up until the 20th century, the focus of American archeology span was collecting. Both in the end, contributed knowledge to the education of people of North Carolina about how these people lived, how they died, and what these artifacts meant. Town Creek, Joffrey Coe would invent much of what would become scientific archaeology in the state and train two generations of archaeologists. After initial excavations wrapped up in the 1950s, the mound and several structures were carefully recreated exactly where they originally stood. The curious visitors that once trampled a farmer's field are now welcome to explore a village situated much as it would have been a thousand years ago.